Regarding Men, Episode 40, Gillette Quarterly on Masculinity. Welcome, everyone. This is number 40, Regarding Men. Number 40. How about that? 40 times. And about of it. course, the, the impeccable Paul Elam is here from A Voice for Men and an Ear for Men. And the irrepressible Janice Firmino <laughs> is also here from The Fiamingo Files, etc. So we're all together. And I'm Tom Golden from Men Are Good. And uh, we're going to talk about Gentlemen's Quarterly today. Yes, boys and girls, Gentlemen's Quarterly, that wonderful magazine, did an issue on masculinity. And <laughs> fashion your seatbelts because <laughs> their view of masculinity is probably not quite what yours and ours is. And we're going to be talking about some of those differences as we go along. And we're going to each take one article because the issue was like five, five six, ten articles. How many? I, I forget how many, but. We're going to each take one article and kind of go with that, and um, we'll go from there. So I think Janice is going to start us off uh, with the uh, beginning article. Janice, what are you going to tell us about? Well, I've got the magazine here, and You've my main response thing. to it is... <laughs> right, right. That's what I think of it. No, it isn't really. It's something on like, you know, home improvement. I wouldn't actually buy it, but um, oh, Janice, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that sound. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. we should. In, I, you know, I'd love. I had a fantasy actually while while thinking about our discussion today of of men lining up at cash counters. You know what? pharmacies and wherever you buy GQ all across the land and buying the magazine only to tear it up and <laughs> be filmed or something like that. <laughs> of course, only only feminists can get away with that kind of petulant stuff and, and, and make it look really political and liberated. But oh, yeah, boy. well, you know, um, this it, it's a, a, another instance, I guess, of, of uh, the um, insistence that masculinity must change and evolve and uh, and that you know there's nothing good to be said about masculinity as it has been embodied by men especially by the the regular men who do the work of the world and keep the world turning uh, there's absolutely nothing good to be said about it and um, so here we have this collection of, of essays by people who believe themselves to be thought leaders in society. And um, the, I thought it was fascinating that the new chief editor, a guy named Will Welch, uh, comes forward and, and overtly abandons men and masculinity itself in the opening page of, of, uh, of his opening editorial. He says that, you know, when he told people that he was becoming the general editor of the magazine. Uh, a female friend of his basically said, what a terrible time to have to engage with masculinity. And instead of defending men and masculinity, he just said, yeah, she's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and he goes on to say, yeah, you know, we're living through this time when we've, you know, we've just come off thousands of years of men doing all sorts of terrible things and finally these brave women calling men out and so what do you do he asks i'm paraphrasing of course what do you do when um you know all the the, the only acceptable role for men is to is to shut up and listen <laughs> and and what you do is you produce a magazine like this in which um you know you 100 percent accept feminist dictates about masculinity uh, and you erase the category of masculinity as, as having any kind of positive content. You uh, celebrate femininity, of course. You celebra celebrate androgyny. You celebrate various kinds of trans identities. Um, of course, you celebrate queerness, but you never celebrate masculinity itself as having any kind of content. All you'll really say about regular or traditional conventional masculinity is that it's on the way out whether men realize it or not and men are, men better get with the program and it's it's like most feminist productions it's hectoring it's bullying it's condescending it's smug it's contemptuous 
Um, it has this whole sec section on voices of the new masculinity. Of course, many of the people writing about the new masculinity are women. And of course, those people <laughs> make it very clear that masculinity has to change to accommodate uh, feminist demands. Uh, and this is all about making men softer. Uh, there's a, uh, an, um, an article on men wearing makeup. Um, uh, you know, it's about men crying. There are all sorts of pictures throughout the magazine of men crying. That seems to be the, 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 the favored image. Uh, we've got, you know, this woman, Asya Kate Dillon. Uh, she plays the um, gender non-binary person on that mini, uh, the series Billions. Uh, we have her talking about how people should be free to make up whatever they imagine masculinity and femininity are. And, um, and I looked in particular at what the editors had to say about a um, survey that they conducted with men and women. Uh, and the survey question, or the, the essential issue of the survey was, let me just make sure I've got it, how are perceptions and behaviors surrounding masculinity shifting? And of course, they're begging the question there because the idea is that it has to be shifting. It has to be evolving. It has to be becoming hipper. It has to becoming, be becoming softer. From They're not really here. interested in finding out whether men want masculinity to shift and evolve and change and be undermined and deconstructed. Uh, and, and it's pretty clear that any man who isn't comfortable with their emphasis on how masculinity must evolve. Well, that, that's just a guy that better get with the program and fast because he's somebody that proves that the progress that's taking place is slow. So it's pretty clearly laid out from what the editors have to say about the survey results. There's two basic things that are involved in the changing definition of masculinity. One is men have to be willing to do whatever women say they want <laughs> men to do. They have to be willing to take on the full burden of childcare. There's big emphasis on that, although men, of course, aren't often allowed to, to care for children. Exactly. They have to become emotionally literate in the way that women claim they want men to be. They have to be comfortable crying. They have to be comfortable with queerness. Uh, you know, even down to they're not allowed to, to feel any discomfort when they see overt sexual, um, you know, interaction between two men, you know, all those kinds of things. They're not allowed. That, that's the second major thing, I guess. They're, men are not allowed even in their feelings. Like now even their feelings have to be policed. Uh, if, you know, if they feel uncomfortable crying in public, and this was something that the survey um, mentioned or it asked about and that the editors make a big deal about that according to them only what was it now oh yeah 37 percent of men um, where did it go yes 37 percent of men are uncomfortable crying at a wedding for one thing I thought you know, and they mentioned this as an example of how men are holding on to old stereotypes you know they're not giving themselves permission to get with the full feminist program. For one thing, I thought, so if 37% of men are uncomfortable crying at a wedding, I mean, I'm uncomfortable crying in public. Am I supposed to feel, I mean, actually, I often feel uncomfortable because I can't cry in public. Am I supposed to feel bad about that? So we're, we're you know, we're going to enforce now, you know, the new masculine norms on men. For one thing, I thought that means that 63% of men have I got the, the math right? Uh, feel quite comfortable crying, yeah. which is actually a larger majority than I would have thought. Which is actual bullshit in my Probably, opinion. yeah, probably BS, because it's probably GQ type readers that they're surveying. I mean, it's a pretty <laughs> small survey sample. A thousand but to be fair, I women. must say that every time I look at a groom fixing to tie the knot, I start crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, really, I am too. I don't mean that in a gay sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean a lot of the a lot of the the um, the survey results are not that helpful because they're completely decontextualized. There's one thing about how men are lagging behind women, and that they don't say that um, they that only 25 percent of men 
rated the well-being of their children and families as one of their chief concerns. I, don't know. I mean, what, what does that even mean? I, I, are we to believe that men don't care about their children and families? Like, I, I absolutely know that that is not true. And we have no idea how that you know, how that survey question was framed. I mean, maybe a lot of the guys that were being asked about this are relatively young men who don't have families and children, so they wouldn't have rated that as one of their chief concerns. Like, it's just impossible to know what the what the answer means. And, and it, I thought it was significant that only 42% of women rated the well-being of their children and families as one of their primary concerns. So, I mean, that's, there's not that much difference between the male and female response. So anyway, I mean, a lot of these, these things don't really, it's hard to know what they mean and whether they mean anything at all. But I thought, what I thought was most interesting was this emphasis on how men, the, the, the editor's disapproval of men who don't feel the right way. It's no longer even about appropriate behavior. They make a big deal of the fact that 50% of men say they feel uncomfortable when they see a gay couple kissing, you know, this is oh, terrible. You know, here they are hanging on to these old horrific stereotypes of masculinity. But you know, can, obviously, can people really control their feelings? And is this what we really care about now? What about people's behavior? Doesn't it matter whether people behave with respect and decency? You know, whether they, they support violence or whether they support basic human rights for all, that's what matters, not whether somebody feels comfortable when they see a gay couple kissing or not. And um, yeah, so, you know, it, it's pretty clear from, I mean, I could go on and on, but I, I, I won't bore everybody with, with all their various comments, but it's, it's really clear overall that the, these, are, these are editors who, who feel overt contempt and express overt contempt for any man, men who haven't got with the feminist program. Right. And they must feel that the relatively small minority of men out there who are very, very enthusiastic feminists and haters of regular masculinity and regular men are enough to keep their magazine going. I don't know whether it is or not. But I would certainly hope that just as, G, uh, as Gillette experienced a backlash after its anti-male advertising, that GQ will also feel the hate of uh, feel the heat of readers' disdain, um, at, you know, after this excessively anti-male issue. But that remains to be seen, I guess. Mm. Oh. So that was. <laughs> A depressing start. A, a very depressing <laughs> start. And I think I it's so. a picture. You know, let's, we can be really honest about this. <clears throat> GQ probably ought to be called Gay Quarterly. Um, what it is to me, and I read through a lot of the articles uh, in that issue. And of course, I have a history with that magazine, having had them do a hit piece on me and the people at ABFM in the past. Right. But looking at it now, what this looks like is a bunch of bitter, misandric gay men practicing the politics of sexuality who have found refuge for, for man-hating. And I, I get that, that a lot of gay men come by this honestly. They, they have experienced rejection and uh, being ostracized by mainstream community historically. And I think feminism gave them a great platform to come in and feel like a victim and to project that hatred out onto het heterosexual men, which is exactly what they do. Um, they practice hate and it's an unfortunate reality, but it's none too surprising. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Should we go on to number two? Number two. Or did you have more to say, Janice? No, no. I mean, I got more to say about other other of the articles, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, let's trudge on to number two, uh, which is the one that I did, and it's an article called Katrina Karakazis on the Science of Masculinity. And this one really got me. <clears throat> I, I saw that and I thought, that's the article I'm going to do. Because <clears throat> the article is on testosterone. 
It's all on testosterone. And here's the deal. The whole, whole issue is based on one assumption. And that assumption is everything is socially constructed. Everything is based on what you learn from mommy and daddy. And there's no such thing as any biological determinants of masculinity. Their whole shtick is based on that idea. If, if even a part of that it falls out, everything crushes down. Everything. Because they can't, oh God, when I was in Division 51, I used to write these articles or these posts and talk about testosterone and how it was involved in masculinity this, and masculinity that. They would be furious with me. They would call me a biological determinist mm -hmm. for just bringing up the idea that testosterone might be related to masculinity. And I was certainly willing and, and harbored the idea that, that socialization is a part of masculinity, but so is biology and so is genetics. I mean, there's all kinds of things that go into it, but they are so, they've got the blinders on so steep that they cannot and will not see any kind of biological factors that are, that are connected in with masculinity. Because if they did, that means they couldn't control men like that because they'd have to adjust for men being a little bit different because of their hormones mm -hmm. and other things. And so to me, this article was fascinating because it was her trying to separate the idea of testosterone from masculinity. Mm -hmm. And they're very creative and very clever <laughs> in how they do that. But they never, of course, do it. I mean, you can't separate the two. And I looked at her book that she wrote. The, the article's fairly short, but she also wrote a book on, what's it called? Uh, <clears throat> Testosterone, an unauthorized biography. That's it. Okay, big deal. But when I looked through that book, I searched the book on the researchers that I knew to be the current top researchers in testosterone and eh -eh. <laughs> Eisenhower was not in there. Eisenhower is this wonderful researcher who's been doing this fan. He's dead now. Bless his heart. He's a young guy and he died. I wonder if the dad gone, somebody didn't kill him off because he was really getting at the idea of how connected testosterone is with masculinity. And he was saying, no, it doesn't have to do with aggression and violence. It has to do with status. Testosterone pushes us to strive for status. And oh boy, that makes the feminist boil. Because you see, if that's true, then that explains at least partly why men would be more likely to be CEOs. Mm -hmm. They've got this juice inside that says, I'm going to strive for status. I'm going to try and be the best I can be. And that juice pushes them to do better and better and better and to stick with it. You know, we find that women will we'll learn things and go to school and get out and get a job, but then they go back to the family. You know, they go back and pull back. Men don't do that. Men just stick with it straight through. That's testosterone. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of things we know about testosterone that she omitted, you know, the, the things that it does. But the, the most important part is this whole striving for status. And she was completely mum on that. Not only did she not mention uh, the researchers that are current, but she also kind of said, well, this whole status thing, you know, they made a mistake. They made a mistake with status. And she didn't talk about Eisenhower. She didn't talk about the recent research, which is much more convincing. She was talking about this stuff in the 80s and 90s. Hmm. But it's it's just not convincing because it's um, they got it confused. They, it's not really masculinity they were talking about. Because and then she takes these little studies and says, well, well, you know, they had uh, poor men, did this and rich men did that. And no, they can't say that testosterone did that because their two are very different, which they are. But if you look at it from a status point of view, they're very similar. Because guess what? With status, a criminal, his high status is gonna be the best crime he can do. You know, a, a, a thug, his best crime is to beat the crap out of people, including women, right? That's his status. So you can't connect these dots. That doesn't, doesn't connect. Because every man has a different way to strive for status. It's really fascinating, all the different ways. You know, the, the academes strive for status in the journals they get into. Of course. You know? And it's this whole hierarchy of who's, who's the top, who comes down from their football. You know, am I in the Pro Bowl? You know, 
all of the, the, the guy that, that puts the, uh, 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 the peace Nick, you know, he puts together conferences for peace. He's going to strive to do the best peace conference he can do. You know, so it's very <laughs> um, camouflaged men striving for status. Sometimes you can't, you can't pinpoint, you can't pinhole it and say, this is what it is. And so that's why a lot of the research before on testosterone is confused because they didn't really factor in that status is, is what's underneath things. Hmm. And that's what is a feminist killer in boys and girls. You know, this whole testosterone piece and the striving for status is an absolute killer. But you got to hear one of the things she says here at the end. Testosterone often gives men a pass for their negative behavior and a pass for their success. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I picked that out too. Boy, men can't men can't win, can they? You yeah, can't okay. win. If it they gives behave men a pass. badly, if they behave badly, you can't say it's, it's anything testosterone. To do, you know, that, 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 that's natural, that's biological. <laughs> that there's any part of it that has to do with with hormones. No, you can't say that. But even when they do really well and make these massive contributions to our civilization that enable us all to live in uh, absolutely unimaginable, previously unimaginable comfort and, and security. That too and is an offense. <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And damn them for saying that it, it's, you know, it's something in them that strives to, yes. to achieve these things and to yes. invent and, and to compete and to be the best. <laughs> and this last little quote tells you how she has rationalized this whole issue. It's really fascinating. I hope we can stop attaching so many behaviors to masculinity as though they're exclusively the province of men. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. Because they often happen to be things that are valued, like risk-taking or athleticism. Mm -hmm. Conversely, I think we're reaching a point where we can shove more under the umbrella of masculinity. Men staying home and parenting their children or men expressing feelings in public ways can be understood as masculine. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And she doesn't understand that, guess what, guys? Testosterone limits your tears. And men have larger tear ducts. So you're not going to see the tears in the same way you would with women. But she's not taking that biology into account. She is just looking at how Can't. men need to be more like women. And mm -hmm. since there's no differences, there's no biological differences, we need to make them more like women because women are superior. It's all there, isn't it? It's incredible. In that little yeah. little paragraph, yeah, it just that, fits it right in. The, but this the, is the, what they're afraid of. This yeah. is what they're afraid of, that someone will finally figure out that, uh-oh, testosterone does have an impact. It does play a, a significant yes, role. Yeah. She, 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 she overtly says, she overtly says that if we if we ascribe anything to testosterone, it means we can't transform the world. She, well, yes. she doesn't say it that way, but she says something like, um, if we accept, well, I, don't, I think this is paraphrasing, but if we accept that every, anything is biological, then it seems impossible to change it. I think that's her actual yeah. phrase. No, that's, you know, it's not an either or. Societies have, throughout history, figured out ways, inventive ways of working with biology to get the best out of people. That's obvious, but they can't stand that. That, nope. if, that there's anything that might stand in the way of their counter human program for utopian revolution. And social, socialization is their excuse for bashing men. Things that we think of as masculine are, are, um, are valued. She doesn't like that. I know. That we value anything men do despite the 50 years of feminist propaganda to say everything is wrong with men we still value some of the ways men are and some of the and things that, that absolutely do. kills her yeah her yes <clears throat> what i thought was really great uh, about this what you were saying tom is that you really pointed out the glass ceiling the so-called glass ceiling is not constructed from discrimination and privilege it's constructed right. from testosterone. Mm -hmm. and, it absolutely and choice. And, and, well, yeah. Uh, people, and genetics. People at GQ will never talk about the level of sacrifice, 
commitment and persistence it takes to Succeed. go past that glass, glass yep. ceiling. Yep. People like Hillary Clinton who, oh, we need to bust the glass ceiling and we still haven't done it yet. That's right. You haven't. And it's all everyone else's fault. Yeah. And, and <laughs> as long as you're blaming the rest of the world for your failures, you never will break it. Yes, uh, exactly. It, it's an unfortunate reality, but God, the mental gymnastics, I read that piece too, Tom, and the mental gymnastics it required to make up how, you know, testosterone isn't about status. It's not about anything. Uh, and all she did was critique studies from the 80s. Yes. Um, it's like, hello. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have an agenda here? Yeah, and you know, it also adds up that, that what this testosterone stuff tells us is about the whole precarious manhood piece which is one of the most important differences between men and women. Precarious manhood says men have to strive for status and they have to get, and men will value getting higher and higher. And our culture, our entire culture will judge men for not getting there. <laughs> and women don't have any kind of judgment like that. They've got nothing. They cannot understand how men are and how men do things and how men feel to be in the world. They can't because they don't have that same precarious manhood piece where you're judged severely if you do not measure up and you're judged every day. And women and don't get that. And criticize about the whole arena of precarious manhood. I think there's, there's some important stuff to educate men on yes. about that so that they don't go off themselves when they feel like failures. Really? Um, really? I think we can reach men on that level. Oh. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that precarious manhood is also what put us on the moon. Absolutely. Uh, and exactly right. Exactly right. And it's men who did it. <clears throat> Absolutely. And you know, what we, what our work really is to help men understand that they have worth in being. Yep. Not just worth in doing. They have worth in doing. That's good. But they also have worth in being. And that's what you forget if you off yourself. You forget that you have any worth in your being. You know? Ugh. So we're ready for number three, Paul? Yeah, I think we're ready for number three. And I think that's a good segue. Good. Number three. Uh, I did it on purpose. We're, we're looking at, I mean, again, I was just flabbergasted at the derision, ignorance. Um, I'm going to make sure I get this person's name right on this piece about men's groups. As a matter of fact, oh, God. it's titled, My Time Inside a Group Where Men Confront Their Feelings. <laughs> so first of all, people don't confront their feelings. That's bullshit. People express <laughs> feelings or they don't. They don't confront them. Uh, but according to Benji Hansen Bundy, um, I won't even touch that last name. Um, I was going to say. Uh, they, they confront their feelings. And of course, but he makes a, before I get to the meat of this article, he makes it a point in this to say, when he's talking about these groups, these men's groups, of course, none of these self-betterment projects ought to be confused with so-called men's rights groups the more hostile of which lurk in the gutter swamps of oh, the web, God. trafficking in the worst kinds of antagonistic anti-woman rhetoric and even spurring some men to violence. Um, man. Okay. Well, as somebody that has men's groups uh, in the gutter swamp of uh, the internet, I guess also known as Zoom, um, <laughs> I don't know where the gutter swamp is, but apparently I'm in it. Um, Smells good to me. This guy does a perfect illustration of what's wrong with feminism. Yes. First of all, he approaches it with the idea that men are defective women. That's always the baseline. Yes. When you see feminists talking about men and their emotional lived experience. Uh, is that we're defective women, we need to learn how to cry more and to cry more openly. And according to this author, also, we also need to be comfortable with a penis in our mouth. <laughs> that, that's their idea of masculinity is deference to women and homosexual sex. 
And uh, I mean, I'm not going to candy coat that. That's the agenda here. You read it all the way through the article. But interestingly enough, to begin with, they talk about men, this, this idea of men expressing their feelings oh, and how these men have come together and they express feelings. And of course, for this bisexual writer with a homosexual ag political agenda, then the men he experienced in groups talked about in whispers about, I had sex with a man. Uh, it was one of the first things that was divulged in his group. Right. Now, I do groups of men every week. And we've been doing this over a year now. And what I hear in groups isn't, I had sex with a man, although that would be perfectly open for, for guys yes. to say, nobody really cares right. about that. But what I hear is, I haven't seen my kids in three years. Exactly. What I hear is, I've been suicidal for the past year, ever since I got served. What I hear is, I tried to tell my family she was abusing me, and my father told me to man up and take it, and that if I wouldn't, I was worthless. These are the things that I hear from men when they are in an emotionally safe environment, and I agree we need to create emotionally safe spaces for men. There's, there's no doubt about it. But it isn't in most men's way to treat emoting as, as the cathartic healing. Some men, yes, it, it, they need to cry and they need to get out. And that does happen in my groups. It absolutely happens. But what happens more and more is men talking about their vulnerabilities in life and how yes. they've been hurt yes. by the, the deck that is stacked against them. And this is a lengthy article by Bundy. Not one word, not one word about parental alienation, not one word about a, a ruinous ruling in a divorce court, uh, not one word about really even about men's suicide. It didn't even get close to it. No. He talks about that men need to secretly be able to be comfortable with kissing each other. And that's what these groups are about. I'm not kidding. This is some of the sickest shit I've ever read in my life. And it's being peddled out there. They say there's hundreds of these groups. I hope not. Um, because what they're really saying is, we want to create a space where it is comfortable for men to express the politically correct notions that we want to hear from mm -hmm. them. That is their agenda. That's their only agenda. And I can guarantee you, even though this writer would never admit it, men who came in and talked about their negative experiences with women would be drummed out of there. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want to hear that because right. this is political. It's not psychological. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right off the bat, he talks about how he'd been in groups before where there was homophobia and misogyny. So he, he clearly says there is to be no discussion of gynocentrism. There's never to be any blaming of a particular woman or of a feminist policy or anything like that. This is all about speaking within a very narrow range of acceptable opinion. And he makes it very clear what that is. That's like pulling a bunch of people into a group and saying, here, we're trained professionals. We are going to help you. We're creating this safe environment, but you have to say what we want to hear. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, there's something wrong with you. There's something defective about you. Yeah. This is abhorrent practice. It's crazy. It, it's disgusting. Uh, people, honestly, I believe people that operate that way ought to be in jail. If, mm -hmm. if they're in any way purporting what they do to be a mental health service, and they're actually injecting their politics into the people they purport to help, there's something that's more disgusting than feminism to me about yeah. that particular practice. And that's what this 21, 22 paragraphs of story was all about, mm -hmm. was just getting men to admit that they're defective women and that they sexually like men. And if they'll just do that, they'll be okay. They'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he even does say that his, his, he has a therapist apparently, but he says at some point that, uh, 
you know, his therapist admits that what they're doing in these groups is, you know, just as important as therapy with a professional. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, he, he, the, the condescension and contempt for men, he talks about men as having to get past the point, what did he say exactly, that they are, um, oh, now I'm not going to be able to find it. But he, oh, yeah, he says men need help to become more than emotional third graders. Wow. I wouldn't want to talk to a man that believes that about me because <laughs> I'm not, I, I, I don't articulate my experience in precisely the way he demands I be able to. Correct. Wow. I mean, talk about judgmental. Really? He says, this is all part of the system because what we have here is this, in this 50 years of male bashing, telling men how inferior they are. We do have a couple of generations of men out there that are ready to hear how to not be an emotional, emotional third, grader third grader because wow. they believe the hype that, they, that they've had pounded into them been their taught. whole lives by the academic institutions, even by grade school anymore. This is yeah. what we're doing to boys. Yeah. So it makes sense to me. This is a great business model. You abuse a class of people for a couple of generations and then you start, they did mention that they have extra special workshops that you can attend that even the writer of the article admitted was very pricey. Uh, uh, you could make a lot of money off of your abuse victims by reinforcing their abuse. Um, yeah. This is a, a men's magazine. Not really. No, it's not. It, it is... A, a magazine by and for bitter homosexual misandric men. And I don't think it's anything else. And I think that got confirmed as I read both of the pieces that you guys did and the other stuff and the makeup tips for men. Um, hey, man, it, it, yeah, you know what? It, it, I, I will love, just love to live with my archaic view of manhood. Um, yes rather than indulge in this sick tripe that she was peddling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. It's a, it's really amazing. I mean, in that article, you see him just twisting himself into knots to, on the one hand, seem to understand what, you know, 20 years or more of, of men's issues activism has brought to the forefront, or not to the forefront of public consciousness, but at least has, has made it, pretty much impossible to ignore that there are issues that men face. And he lists a few of them, you know, he, he mentions, um, he mentions a high incidence of suicide. He mentions men dying younger than women. He mentions men, men having more chronic diseases and being victims of violence. Of course, he could have gone on. That's all on patriarchy on. though. That's all patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, of course it's men's fault themselves, but he mentions those things. And he talks about the fact that men are not rewarded for expressing their emotions in public, but he never says who doesn't reward them. You know, <laughs> you know, he never, and he still, he keeps insisting, even after he, he rattles off all these problems, then he says, this is all about male privilege. Although point. any reasonable, <clears throat> you know, analysis of a society where one group commits violence against itself where men kill themselves far more often than they kill women, where men die younger, and he could have gone on and on, you know, where men, of course, are incarcerated at massively higher rates than women, where men kill themselves at massively higher rates, where men are homeless at massively higher rates, where men have, have um, addictions at massively higher rates. I mean, he could have gone on and on and on, and yet what kind of a society is that a society where that is the privileged group. Yet he, he, right. You know, Never, I'm sure yeah. Because there's no self-awareness at all in, right. in his, whole, his whole spiel. I have a reaction. Uh, for these guys too, that may be subscribed to this stuff. If you have a woman that is starting to show interest in you, take her to a movie and start crying in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Sit there and blubber in your tears and ask her for a Kleenex and show her how emotionally open and vulnerable you are and then see if you get laid. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I think we can guess the answer to that. Like a hot potato. Look, 
Janice touched on it a minute ago, and it's something that these guys never, ever talk about, is these crazy, effeminate expectations that they're putting on men is exactly what will sexually isolate them. It yes. will cause them rejection from the other sex. Why don't men cry as much as women? Because women will reject them if they do. That's yes. A, that's a and partial they... answer. There's other stuff in that. But the thing is, if you practice the model of manhood that people like Bundy and others from GQ are prescribing, you will sleep alone. You yeah. will not have the respect of a woman. And you know, it, a, it man's, just, a man's pain is taboo. You know, no yeah. one wants to hear that shit. And it's proven, you know, I, I keep thinking back to the 80s and 90s with the mythopoetic men's movement, you know, where men literally started getting together and going out into, quote, safe spaces in the forest and emoting with each other. And what did the culture say about that? You know, they didn't say, bravo, men finally emoting. No, they said, oh, those terrible men, what are they doing? You know, they're, they're, they're beating drums in the woods and taking their clothes off. There's something wrong with those men, you know? There's immediate judgment when men emote, immediate. It's not, it's not uh, something that takes a long time to figure out. And there is a, a, a component of that, too, that I have to say I'm okay with. Um, What's that? Well, civilization needs strong men. Yes. Uh, it's, it's not, I don't want to call it fair, but fair is what you pay on the bus. Civilization needs strong men. And the way men have learned to adapt to this arrangement with society where they're, they don't emote is they, they deal with their emotions through actions. Yes. And they work together. They combine efforts. And mm. they spend time together without emoting. Yes. Uh, and men have learned to adapt to this. And, Correct. And we do. We lose guys to suicide. It's tough being a man. It yeah. is. It, yeah. It's hard, hard to be a man. But it is possible to get through this. And on the end, and I just did a talk on this from my YouTube channel, in the end, men are much happier than women. Despite yes. all of our supposed emotional defects, <laughs> overall, our happiness level is much greater. Oh, those happy, toxic men. And it's part of it is the culture we live in. You can take the average guy, put him in a studio apartment with a pantry full of ramen noodles, and <laughs> he will figure out a way to be happy. Yeah. You put an average woman in a three-bedroom penthouse, and she'll figure out a way to be miserable. <laughs> That's what's going on in our culture right now. Women have lost happiness. They, the, the roles mm -hmm. are reversed. That's in what the research says. Women were happier than men. When women mm -hmm. were getting married and felt cherished in their homes and protected and provided for, they were happy. Then feminism came along, and guess what? It swapped. Right about 1984 is where we crossed, and suddenly men were happier than women mm -hmm. and have widened the gap since then. Yeah. This is all from the studies I have. I just posted mm -hmm. it to regarding men, by the way. Yeah. Um, all right. Overall, men, despite their struggles, are psychologically doing just fine the way they handle things. They don't yes. need a change or improvement. As a matter of fact, I could make some suggestions to women about mastery of emotions mm -hmm. that would you know. be very helpful to them if it wasn't seen as so misogynistic to... Mm -hmm. To, to make those suggestions. Mm -hmm. yeah. The ironic thing yeah. is that when you talk about um, resilience, you know, they talk about resilience, what they're talking about is the masculine, you know, because the, when they talk about resilience, they're talking about people who move into things and take action and do things in honor of, and they, they get involved, you know, that's the masculine way. Yep. And so really the way men do things is what we're calling resilience, but we're, they're not labeling it as such, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. so guys, you're doing it right. You know, stick with it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I job. think, I mean, we talked about this in an earlier episode when we talked about women's declining happiness and the fact yes. that men are still in general feeling kind of good about themselves. Yes. I mean, there were problems with that study, I thought, but um, partly because men, I don't think, would admit when they're not, when they're in pain. Right. Um, but, but, but that overall, you know, and it really did make me think too that I think men still have despite all the negative messaging and even maybe because of all the negative messaging 
men have a standard of goodness. They have things, you know, they have an idea of what they want to be, what kind of man they want to be. Yes. And women don't have that anymore. That's supposed to be, you know, now that that's a traditional women still have it to a certain extent, but feminism tells women that all those, those myths about female goodness and female virtue are just patriarchal, you know, forms right. of oppression right. great so point. that they should throw all those out. You I ask know. a feminist, what's a good woman? She'll just laugh right. or she'll say a, a good woman and, you know, beats up her attacker in a Montreal <laughs> bar like Mona El Tahawi. Um, so they, there's no positive content to womanhood, according to feminism. And now I think what GQ is, is trying to do, GQ is trying to now say it's the same thing for men. You know, that, that right. men shouldn't have any standards of virtue or strength or uh, resilience, that they should, you know, accept feminisms. Uh, definition of masculinity and I think they want men to be as unhappy as women are so <laughs> yes. unhappy people are easier to control there you people go. who don't have a sense of their destiny who don't have a sense of what they want to achieve in their lives who don't have the determination to, to move past feelings of inadequacy or insecurity or whatever and to actually do things which is mm. the male way in general yes. Yes. They don't they, they don't like that because those kinds of people are way harder to control. Mm. So I think this is part of a whole feminist leftist revolutionary project to destroy men. Yeah, what a great point. They're doing a pretty good job of it too. Yeah, yes, they are. But it's even a real with that, concerted attack. Even with that, your point is is really valid, I think, that men do have a sense of what a good man is. They do. And yeah. they strive to do that. You know, mm -hmm. for themselves, they don't talk about it, but they they're striving to do that. Yeah, it's a really good point. Whereas women do not have that same kind of not uh, anymore. Push. No, because they've been told all those things are bad because they had to do with being yeah. being chaste, being loyal, being self-sacrificing, standing right. by your man, looking after your children, you know, or doing something for the good of society. If you chose not to get married, you could be a nun or you know, do whatever. Um, <laughs> but they all had to do with doing things for others. Yes. Feminism came along and said, "Oh no, no, no! You have to do it for yourself." That's right. And that's that's empty. That just leads yes. to narcissism and yes. you know agony, really, selfishness and, yes. and bitterness. Men don't have that. You know, men men uh, un, even unhappy men tend to focus on doing something. Yes, doing good. Yeah, doing like, something yeah. good. Huh. Yeah. So well, that's a great place to for GQ. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a good place to stop. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get rid of this cough soon, I hope. Sorry about that. I have a suggestion for oh. Flying Puta. Oh, yeah. Award. Let's give it to GQ. Yeah. But we can use Jeff Charlotte back in in. Oh, that sucker. I remember. He wrote a hit piece on ABFM in our first international conference. He was a guy right. that brought a female with him and a pedophile with him to the conference dragging them around, trying to get people to say incriminating things so he could write about it. Um, why don't we put Jeff Charlotte's head representing GQ for the Flying Puta Award? He certainly deserves it. And maybe um, we'll mark up his face like they did to your picture they put in there. Yeah, probably a good idea. Yeah, man. Jeez. And what a scumbag. I want to suggest the Humanitarian Award, too. Too? To the guy who came up with this hat. <laughs> Who's that? That would be Tom Golden. <laughs> this, is, this is, by the way, you know, you've heard of MAGA hats. This is my MAG hat. <laughs> MAG, that's good. <laughs> um, and yeah. comes from mm. menaregood.com, uh, a website you should go visit all the time. Tom has done great work for men and boys, absolutely stellar works, tons of stuff, I guarantee you. Most people don't even know about dating all the way back yeah. to your work with the Maryland Health Commission and yeah. the stuff you've done for men for many, many years. Um, I don't think I'll have it here any objections to. to <laughs> That's for sure. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that mm -hmm. and would add that we're, we've all done important work, you know, both of you. Yeah, but you get the award this time. I'll take it. I'll take it. Next <laughs> time right. I'm going to slide it on somebody else. Okay. But thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. And so the Flying Puta to Jeff Charlotte and GQ, Tom mm -hmm. Golden, 
gets the humanitarian award and we get to close out shop and close. say goodbye to everybody till we see you again in another week. Good deal. Good discussion, guys. Yeah. yeah. It was great. All right. Good discussion, awful magazine. Yeah. Men <laughs> are good. Men are good. We'll see y'all. Take care. Take, Take care. care.